during this hour is thoughts on the human nature of Christ. This is a very solemn and very important message. I would like to pray as we start to ask for the Lord's blessing. Father in heaven, we come before your awesome throne in the powerful name of Jesus, our intercessor. We ask that you will be present through the ministry of your spirit, that you will bless this presentation. Help us understand that it is possible to overcome through divine power. Thank you for hearing our prayer, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. On February 17 through 19, 2015, the Biblical Research Institute of the General Conference held a symposium in the city of Medellin, Colombia. The symposium was for all pastors, administrators, and teachers of the entire country. Most of the members who serve on the BRI committee of the General Conference were there to present papers on different theological issues that were facing the church at that time and still face the church. The organizers of the symposium invited me to make two presentations on the human nature of Christ. However, they never asked me beforehand what I believed about the subject. At the symposium, I presented the post-lapsarian view and nothing short of an earthquake ensued. The tumult occurred because the overwhelming majority of those who were present believed that Christ took the sinless nature of Adam before the fall. Things got so testy that one of the representatives of the Biblical Research Institute, who for several years served as its director, stood up before the plenary session of over 600 delegates to pacify the turbulent waters. He said that my presentation was very well done and that it was one of two views that are held presently by scholars in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. However, he lamented that someone did not present the opposing view to the view that I had presented. He underlined that the church had no official position on the human nature of Christ. And therefore, both views, pre-lapsarian and post-lapsarian, were equally acceptable. The waters were calmed somewhat. Several days later, another member of BRI, who did not participate in the symposium, but shared the view that I have, called me and said the following. At our meeting this morning, at the General Conference, we got a report that you had an excellent presentation on the human nature of Christ in the city of Medellin. Many of the thoughts that I'm going to share are from that symposium, as well as from a book which I consider to, to be the best on the human nature of Christ. It's called Touched with Our Feelings, a very important book. The subtitle is a historical survey of Adventist thought on the human nature of Christ. And the author is Gene Searcher. Uh, it's a book that has been out of print. Uh, however, you can obtain copies from Secrets Unsealed. Let me tell you something about the author, Gene Searcher. Before he died, he was the director of the Biblical Research Institute of the Euro-Africa Division as well as Division Secretary. He served as theology professor in several Seventh-day Adventist universities. He also uh, had his book published, this book, by the Review and Herald in the year 1999, which means that at that time it was not deemed heretical. The book is a historical and theological study of how the Seventh-day Adventist Church changed its view of Christology in the decade of the 1950s. Dr. Searcher was an accomplished scholar. He also wrote a book called The Nature and Destiny of Man on Anthropology, a book that was acclaimed internationally by non-Adventist scholars. 
as we approach this subject, we want to ask several questions, and I'll go through them quickly. I'm trying to synthesize two presentations in one. What do we mean by a sinful and a sinless human nature? Is it a sin to have a sinful nature, or is sin allowing the sinful nature to express itself in sinful acts, thoughts, and words? In what way does the Roman Catholic view of original sin differ from the Adventist concept that we inherit the sinful, a sinful nature? Now we all agree that Jesus is 100% God and 100% man. However, the critical question is this, what kind of humanity did Jesus take when he came to this earth? Did he take the human nature of Adam before the fall? Or did he take his nature after the fall? What did Ellen White mean when she wrote that Jesus had no evil propensities towards sin? In our last presentation, we heard quite a bit about this. Is it possible to gain a total victory over sin while we are living in sinful flesh? Would it be fair for Jesus to expect that we follow his example if he had a different human nature than we do? Will God have an end time generation that will totally overcome sin in sinful flesh? When will Jesus remove the sinful nature from his people? Will God's people continue sinning in words, acts, and thoughts after the close of probation? Will we be able to send our sins to the heavenly sanctuary after the close of probation? Is there biblical corroboration that confirms that Ellen White was right when she said that God's people will have to live in the time of trouble without an intercessor or mediator? And finally, the last question, will the last generation be different than any previous generation? Now, there are some aspects that are not negotiable when we come to this subject. First, while Jesus was on earth, he was 100% God and 100% man. But he never used his own divine power to conquer temptation. He always depended on the divine power of his Father. Second, it is possible for us to overcome as Jesus overcame, if we depend on the same power that he did. The sinless example of Jesus is attainable. Three, the temptations of Jesus were far greater than the ones that Adam faced or we face. Adam was not tempted to turn stones into bread. Adam did not bear the sins of the world upon himself. Adam was not pursued 24-7, 365 by Satan. The temptations of Jesus were infinitely greater than the temptations that we fa face. So, as Ellen White says, we can imitate the example, but we cannot copy the example because his temptations were far greater than ours. Finally, the fourth issue that is non-negotiable is that Jesus never cultivated evil tendencies towards sin. He never felt inclined to sin. In fact, he recoiled from temptation the instant that temptation came. Now, there are dangers lurking with both views. On the one hand, those who believe in total victory over sin before the close of probation are always in danger of falling into the deadly errors of perfectionism and fanaticism, thinking highly of themselves and criticizing others for not reaching their high plane of spirituality. However, the danger on the other side is to take sin lightly and to justify it because of our inherited and cultivated tendencies. The danger of this side is to teach that man's human nature is so powerful 
that not even God's omnipotent enabling grace can give us total victory over it. Those who say that it is not possible to totally overcome sin before the close of probation are not really saying that sinful human nature is weak, but rather that God is not powerful enough to help us overcome it. They are saying, perhaps inadvertently, that our sinful flesh is more powerful than the enabling power of God. Those who are closest to perfection can never say, I have arrived. In fact, those who are most holy in the sight of God, even those who will go through the time of trouble, are those who feel the most sinful because they are constantly beholding the perfect beauty of Christ's character and how much sin cost in Gethsemane and on the cross. Like Isaiah, when they contemplate the holiness of Jesus, they will say, I am undone. Like Peter, they will say, depart from me, for I am a sinful man. Like Paul, they will exclaim, who shall deliver me from this body of death? Like holy Daniel, they will say, we have sinned. Now there's a very important point. Let's not attempt to defend the indefensible by saying that the Adventist church has always believed that Jesus took the nature of Adam before the fall. It is a documented fact that the Seventh-day Adventist church in its majority has changed its Christology. And it was changed in the middle of the 20th century from a post-lapsarian view to a pre-lapsarian view. As I learned in the symposium in Medellin, most scholars in our theological schools and seminaries and probably most of our administrators and pastors have embraced the new Christology. It's interesting that Jones and Wagoner of 1888 fame taught that Jesus took human nature after the fall. In fact, Wagoner suggested that we consider the genealogy of Jesus in order to determine the human nature that Jesus took upon himself. Among the ancestors of Jesus was lying Abraham, David the adulterer and murderer, and Manasseh the idolater. Jesus received the sinful fallen nature of his human ancestors, but he never sinned in that sinful nature. Jones wrote, that Jesus possessed the passions and tendencies of sinful flesh, but he never participated in those sins. It is vital to understand the difference between having the passions and tendencies and yielding to those passions and tendencies. A.T. Jones wrote in General Conference Bulletin 1895, page 328, the following words, The flesh of Jesus Christ was our flesh. And in it was all that is in our flesh. All the tendencies to sin that are in our flesh were in his flesh, drawing upon him to get him to consent to sin. But of course, Jesus never consented to the tendency. W. w, w. Prescott, uh, whose view Ellen White enthusiastically endorsed, wrote the following. Although Jesus Christ took sinful flesh, flesh in which we sin, he took that flesh and emptying himself and receiving the fullness of God himself, God was able to keep him from sinning in that sinful flesh. So that although he was manifested in sinful flesh, God by his spirit dwelling in him kept him from sinning in that sinful flesh. On October 31, 1895, Ellen White heard Elder Prescott preach a sermon on the Word made flesh and enthusiastically endorsed his uh, pre presentation. Catholics and many Protestants teach the doctrine of original sin. The basic idea is that we are born sinners. 
because Adam bequeathed the guilt of his original sin to us. In other words, we are guilty because as descendants of Adam, we inherit Adam's sinful flesh. According to this view, if Jesus had been born with the same sinful nature as the rest of humanity, he would have been sinful by birth. In such a case, Jesus would have needed a Redeemer. There is no doubt that everyone in this world is born with a sinful human nature. That is to say, the pull of sin dwells in each descendant of Adam. And that power or pull entices us to commit actual sins. Jesus had the pull, but Jesus did not sin. Is sin a state of being or is, say, sin a choice? We sin because we choose to act, speak, or think contrary to the revealed will of God. Sin is to allow our fallen human nature to act in opposition to the will of God. If sin is not a matter of nature, but rather of choice, then Jesus could have inherited our sinful human nature without becoming a sinner. Jesus remained sinless because the very moment the temptation came, he chose by a decision of his will to obey God and never allowed sinful human nature to control his actions. His inheritance was like ours, but his choices were different. Ellen White confirmed this point of view. She wrote, There are thoughts and feelings suggested and aroused by Satan that annoy even the best of men. But now listen to this. But if these thoughts and feelings are not cherished, if they are repulsed, Ellen White says that Jesus recoiled when he was tempted, if they are repulsed as hateful, the soul is not contaminated with guilt and no other is defiled by their influence. Powerful statement. Here's another one. By faith and prayer, all may meet the requirements of the gospel. No man can be forced to transgress. Listen carefully now. His own consent must first be gained. The soul must purpose the sinful act before passion can dominate over reason or iniquity triumph over conscience. Temptation, however strong, is never an excuse for sin. Messages to Young People, page 67. Here's one more. The Son of God in His humanity wrestled with the very same fierce, apparently overwhelming temptations that assail men. Temptations to indulge of appetite, to presumptuous venturing where God has not led them, and to the worship of God of this world, to sacrifice an eternity of bliss for the fascinating pleasures of this life. Everyone will be tempted, but the Word declares that we shall not be tempted above our ability to bear. So we do not inherit the guilt of our ancestors because we receive a sinful nature from them. We are only guilty when we personally choose to respond to the pleadings of our sinful nature. Notice Deuteronomy chapter 24 and verse 16. Fathers shall not be put to death for their children, nor shall children be put to death for their fathers. A person shall be put to death for his own sin. Ezekiel chapter 18 verse 20 adds its testimony. The soul who sins shall die. The son shall not bear the guilt of the father, nor the father bear the guilt of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. Now I'm going to skip one statement because uh, we have very brief time. Let's go now to the way in which the Christology of the Adventist Church has changed. Let's examine, first of all, a portion of the 1947 edition of Bible Readings for the Home. And by the way, 
It is the same all the way back to the year 1914 in Bible readings for the home. We're going to go to section 4, chapter 39. The title is A Sinless Life, question number 6. Question number 6 in Bible readings for the home says this. How fully did Christ share our common humanity? Now comes the answer from Hebrews 2.17. Wherefore, in all things, it behoved him to be made like unto his brethren, that is, like us, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. So that's the biblical answer. Now there's an explanatory note in the 1947 edition. It reads like this. In his humanity... Christ partook of our sinful, fallen nature. If not, then he was not made like unto his brethren, was not in all points tempted like as we are, did not overcome as we have to overcome, and is not therefore the complete and perfect Savior man needs and must have to be saved. The idea that Christ was born of an immaculate, sinless mother, inherited no tendencies to sin, and for this reason did not sin, removes him from the realm of a fallen world and from the very place where help is needed. On his human side, Christ inherited just what every child of Adam inherits, a sinful nature. On the divine side, from his very conception, he was begotten and born of the Spirit. And all this was done to place mankind on vantage ground. And to demonstrate that in the same way, everyone who is born of the Spirit may gain like victories over sin in his own sinful flesh. Thus, each one is to overcome as Christ overcame. Without this birth, birth, there can be no victory over temptation and no salvation from sin. What a powerful note this is. However, in 1949, the Review and Herald requested Professor D.E. Reebok, who was teaching at the seminary in Washington, D.C., to review the text of Bible readings for the home with the intent of publishing a new edition. And in the 1949 edition, the note that we read was deleted. Ralph Larson, in his book, The Word Made Flesh, documented how Ellen White repeatedly wrote that Jesus took our sinful nature and gives multiple quotations from Adventist authors before 1949 who wrote the same. It is indeed tragic that after the church had existed for 90 years, suddenly a change was made. Leroy Froome explained the reason for the deletion of the note. I read, Coming upon this unfortunate note that is Reebok, on page 174, in the study about the sinless life, he, that is Reebok, recognized that this was not true. So the inaccurate note was deleted and has remained, remained out in all sub, sub, subsequent printings. Elder Froome and other leaders of the church wanted the evangelicals to recognize the Seventh-day Adventist church as a bona fide mainstream denomination. And in order to accomplish this, they saw the need to discard the idea that Christ took the sinful nature of Adam, yet without committing sin. According to Donald Gray Barnhouse, in an article that he published, Our Seventh-day Adventist Christians in the Eternity magazine, he had told Walter Martin the following. They had among their number, that is Adventists, certain members of their lunatic fringe, even as there are similar wild-eyed irresponsibles in every field of fundamental Christianity. Between 1955 and 1956, 18 meetings took place between evangelicals and Seventh-day Adventist leaders. And our leaders assured evangelicals, and now I quote from Eternity Magazine, the majority of the denomination has always held 
and, and I'm going to add this in parentheses so we can understand the rest of the statement, have always held the humanity assumed by Christ to be sinless, holy, and perfect, despite the fact that certain of their writers have occasionally gotten into print with contrary views, completely repugnant to the church at large. Absolute untruth. You can read all of the statements before 1949 and you'll find that they say that Christ inherited the sinful human nature. In the book Questions on Doctrine, Leroy Froome included only quotations that supported his point of view and ignored the overwhelming witness of those who contradicted his view. Many of his supporting quotations were taken out of their legitimate context, and he added subtitles that certainly misled the evangelicals to think that Adventists had always believed that Jesus took the, sin, the sinless nature of Adam before the fall. Another one of the leaders of that time, R.A. Anderson, wrote the following, Our Lord partook of our limited human nature, but not our corrupt, carnal nature, with all its propensities to sin and lust. In him was no sin, either inherited or cultivated, as in common, as is common to all the natural descendants of Adam. He added, When the incarnate God broke into human history and became one with the race, it is our understanding that he possessed the sinlessness of the nature with which Adam was created in Eden. The environment in which Jesus lived, however, was tragically different from that which Adam knew before the fall. So there was a difference in environment, but Jesus had the sinless nature of Adam that Adam had before the fall. It's interesting that the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, prepared by 40 Seventh-day Adventist theologians, between 1953 and 1957 has no vestige of the new Christology, in spite of the fact that the book Questions on Doctrine was published in 1957. Also during this period, Selected Messages Volume 1 was published. Many pages speak about the message of Jones and Wagner in 1888. And in that volume, you find no indication of the new Christology. According to Roman Catholic theology, a baby is born guilty of original sin. And therefore, they must be baptized to, re to remove the macula as quickly as possible. The biblical and spirit of prophecy view is different. We believe that we inherited the consequences of Adam's sin, his sinful human nature. But God does not hold us guilty until we choose to sin. Adventist theology teaches that we inherit a sinful human nature that is slanted towards sin. And for this reason, God makes us participants of the divine nature in order to overcome sin in sinful flesh. The more we yield to the pull of our sinful human nature, the stronger that nature becomes. In other words, the nature that we feed becomes strong, and the nature that we starve becomes weak. Jesus had a sinful nature, but he starved the sinful nature to death. Now what does the Bible have to say about the human nature of Christ? Let's read Romans 1, 3, and 4. Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God, which he promised before through the prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, his son Christ, Jesus Christ our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh. Let's go to Romans chapter 8, verses 1 to 3. There is therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh. By the way, the word walk, when it's used figuratively in the Bible, it's talking about behavior or conduct. So in other words, who did not conduct himself, who did not act according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. That's because Jesus had a, had a sinful nature, but the Spirit led him to resist the inclinations of that sinful nature. Verse 2, 
For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh. In what kind of flesh? We just read, in the likeness of sinful flesh. Verse 4, that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. That word likeness there is very interesting, that Jesus came in the likeness of sinful flesh. The Greek word is homiomati, and it's used three times in the New Testament, three critical points, really. All three of them refer to the Incarnation. The first is, of course, Romans 8, verse 3. The second is in Hebrews 2, 17. And the third is in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 7. Each time homoiomathy is used, it refers to similarity, not difference. Clearly, Jesus was not identical to us. In what way was Jesus different than us? Was he different because he took Adam's nature before the fall? Or was he different for another reason? The book of Hebrews tells us that Jesus was made in all things like unto his brethren. But there's one exception, and that is that Jesus never sinned. And Hebrews makes that same clarification in Hebrews chapter 4. In other words, Jesus had sinful flesh like ours, but he did not he was not altogether like us because he never allowed that inclination or that evil propensity to manifest itself in sin. He was so much under the control of the Holy Spirit that he recoiled from evil. His human nature certainly was not like that of Adam before the fall because then the word likeness could not be used because Jesus would have been different, not like. Ellen White wrote in Steps to Christ, page 93 and 94, speaking about Jesus, He is a brother in our infirmities, in all points tempted as we are. But as the sinless one, His nature recoiled from evil. He endured struggles and torture of soul in a world of sin. His humanity made prayer a necessity and a privilege. He found comfort and joy in communion with His Father, and if the Savior and if the Savior of men, the Son of God, felt the need to prayer of prayer, how much more should feeble, sinful mortals feel the necessity of fervent, constant prayer? Let's read now Hebrews chapter 2, 11 through 18. We're dealing with texts that speak about the human nature of Christ. It says there in verse 11, For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified, notice this, this is talking about believers. It is talking about people who have accepted Jesus Christ, not a, a common sinner who has not been born again. For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one. For which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare your name to my brethren. That is, those who have been converted to Jesus Christ, those who have a new nature, the nature given by the Holy Spirit. I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will sing praise to you. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, here am I and the children whom God has given me. And now notice verse 14. Inasmuch then as the children, that is us, have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise, there you have the word, likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is, the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For indeed, he does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham, which he couldn't do if he had Adam's nature before the fall, folks. He continues in verse 17. Therefore, in all things, he had to be made like, here's the homoyomata again, like his brethren. And like doesn't mean difference. It means similarity. He had to be made like his brethren. Now we're going to notice that, uh, that the Apostle Paul makes a clarification when he says all things as one exception. So let's continue reading. Therefore, in all things, he had to be made like his brethren, 
that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered, being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. Hebrews 14 gives us the difference between Jesus and us. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points, you remember he was tempted in all things, we just read in Hebrews chapter 2, he was tempted in all points as Adam was. That's not what it says. He was tempted in all points as we are, yet without sin. That is the difference between Jesus and us. Now let's go to Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 through 8. Jesus made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming, here's the third use of the word homayomata, and coming in the likeness of men. Did Jesus just come like men, but he wasn't a real man? When it says that he, that he had the likeness of man, it, it means that he was a real man. So it says, Jesus made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death of the cross. Now let's go to James chapter 1, 14 and 15. This is really, really interesting because it describes the process of sin. James chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. Let no one say, when he is tempted, that's point number one that I want us to notice. Let no one say, when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is uh, drawn away by his own desires and enticed. And now notice the next point. Then when desire has conceived, the sinful act hasn't come about yet, but the person has, has inclined himself to the temptation. Then when desire has conceived, or has been yielded to, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Now let's take, look, take a look at the stages that we find in these verses. First of all, you have the temptation. At this point, sin has not been conceived. Second, you have yielding to the sinful dire, desire or the sinful propensity. That is the moment when sin is what? Conceived. Then you have the birth of sin. Then you have the growth of sin, and eventually you have death. At which of these stages did Jesus defeat sin? Was it at the point of yielding? No, Jesus defeated sin at the first point. When the sin came, when the temptation came rather, Jesus immediately rejected the temptation. He did not play with it. He was not inclined. He didn't have a tendency to commit that sin, which eventually conceives sin and leads to birth of sin and leads to the growth of sin and eventually leads to death. The Bible defines what sin is. 1 John 3 verse 4 in the King James Version, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. In other words, sin is not something that we are guilty of when we are born. Sin is a choice. It's a choice to disobey God's will, to disobey God's law. Ellen White adds in the book Faith and Works, page 56, Now, we want to understand what sin is, that it is the transgression of God's law. This is the only definition given in the scriptures. Now let's talk about evil propensities for a few moments. What are evil propensities? Basically, they are inclinations to sin that have been strengthened by sinful indulgence. The propensity itself is not sinful until we give in to the propensity. Ellen White explained, that Jesus took the fallen nature, but not corrupted by sin, because he had never allowed the propensity to express itself. He never was inclined to sin. In other words, there was never a, uh, if, you, if you please, the conception of sin, which ultimately leads to committing the sin. 
we find this very interesting statement, manuscript 57, 1890. Here is the test to Christ. Here the test to Christ was far greater than that of Adam and Eve. For Christ took our nature fallen but not corrupted and would not be corrupted unless he received the words of Satan in place of the words of God. Clear, absolutely clear statement. Ellen White repeatedly underlined that Jesus took Adam's fallen nature, but that that nature never expressed itself in sinful acts. The sinful na uh, human nature was ever under the control of the Holy Spirit. Jesus, Jesus never toyed with temptation. He never wondered, should I do it or shouldn't I do it? The very moment that the temptation came, the Holy Spirit led him instantly to reject it. In this way, Jesus condemned sin in sinful flesh. To use the childbirth analogy of James, when temptation came to Jesus, he never allowed it to conceive, and therefore sin was never born. A propensity is a tendency or an inclination to sin. Is the inclination or tendency sinful? No. If the propensity is under the control of the Holy Spirit, the propensity is not sinful. Inherent propensities to sin become evil propensities only after giving in to temptation. And the more we give in, the stronger the sinful propensity becomes. Now I'm going to go to the next section. What did Ellen White have to say about the kind of nature that Jesus took upon himself when he came to this earth? Unfortunately, we don't have time probably to read all these statements. All of them are powerful. By the way, if you, um, if you are watching, you'll be able to get all of my notes from the three presentations as well as the notes of many of the other speakers, maybe all of them. So contact secrets unsealed. What kind of nature, according to Ellen White, did Jesus take upon himself? Notice this. In taking upon himself man's nature, in its fallen condition, can you argue with that? Was it before the fall? No. In taking upon himself man's nature in its fallen condition, now notice, Christ did not in the least participate in its sin. Sinful nature, but without, but without sinning. He was touched with the feeling of our infirmities. That's the title of this book. And was in all points tempted like as we are. And yet he knew no sin. We should have no misgivings in regard to the perfect sinlessness of the human nature of Christ. Why was the human nature of Christ sinless? It was sinless because he didn't sin, folks. It wasn't different than the nature that we receive. In another statement, Ellen White wrote, wrote, the great work of redemption could be carried out only by the Redeemer taking the place of fallen Adam. With the sins of the world upon himself, he would go over the ground where Adam stumbled. He would bear a test infinitely more severe than that which Adam failed to endure. Notice the statements, fallen Adam, where Adam stumbled and where Adam failed to endure. He would overcome on man's account and conquer the tempter. That through his obedience, his purity of character and steadfast integrity, his righteousness might be imputed to man. That through his name, man might overcome the foe on his own account. Here's another one which is very well known. It would have been an almost infinite humiliation for the Son of God to take man's nature, even when Adam stood in his innocence in Eden. Notice, if Jesus had taken the nature of Adam before the fall, it would have been an almost infinite humiliation. But now notice there's a but. But, Jesus accepted humanity when the race had been weakened by 4,000 years of sin. Like every child of Adam, he accepted the results of the working of the great law of heredity. What these results were, uh, were is shown in the history of his earthly ancestors. He came with such a heredity to share our sorrows and temptations and to give us the example of a sinless life. I'm going to skip the next quotation that I have and I'm going to go to the following one after that. Adam 
was tempted by the enemy, and he fell. Now notice this. It was not indwelling sin which caused him to yield. For God made him pure and upright in his own image. He was as faultless as the angels before the throne. There were in him no corrupt principles, no tendencies to evil. Speaking about Adam, but now notice Christ. But when Christ came to meet the temptations of Satan, he bore the likeness of sinful flesh. Wow! Here's another one. In our humanity, Christ was to redeem Adam's failure. But when Adam was assailed by the tempter, none of the effects of sin were upon him. He stood in the strength of perfect manhood, possessing the full vigor of mind and body. He was surrounded with the glories of Eden and was in daily communion with heavenly beings. It was not thus with Jesus when he entered the wilderness to cope with Satan. For 4,000 years, the race had been decreasing in physical strength, in mental power, and in moral worth. And Christ, now this is really amazing, and Christ took upon him the infirmities of degenerate humanity. Only thus could he rescue man from the lowest depths of degradation. Let me read a few more. In Christ were united the divine and the human, the creator and the creature. The tr uh, notice this, the nature of God, whose law had been transgressed, and the nature of Adam, the transgressor met in Jesus. What was the nature that met in Jesus? The divine nature and what? The one of Adam, the transgressor, the son of God and the son of man. Here's another one. Think of Christ's humiliation. He took upon himself fallen, suffering human nature, degraded and defiled by sin. Because sin, sinful human nature is degraded by sin. But you only become a sinner when you actually sin. She continues, he took our sorrows, bearing our grief and shame. He endured all the temptations wherewith man is beset. Some people say, well, Jesus was tempted from outside, but not from inside. Notice this statement. He knows how strong are the inclinations of the natural heart, and he will help in every time of temptation. And then we have Ellen White's comment about the ladder that came from heaven to earth. Christ is the ladder that Jacob saw, the base resting on the earth, and the topmost round reaching to the gate of heaven, to the very threshold of glory. If that, now listen to this carefully, if that ladder had failed by a single step of reaching the earth, we should have been lost. But Christ reaches us where we are. He took our nature, not Adam's nature, our nature, and overcame that we through taking his nature might overcome. Made in the likeness of sinful flesh, he lived a sinless life. So he had sinful flesh, but he lived a sinless life. Now by his divinity, he lays hold upon the throne of heaven while his, by his humanity he reaches us. He bids us by faith in him attain to the glory of the character of God Therefore are we to be perfect, even as our Father, which is in heaven, is perfect. Now let's notice the next one. We're running out of time. Uh, you know, they gave us less time than I'm usually used to, but let's go for it. The Son of God was assaulted at every step by the powers of darkness. After his baptism, he was driven of the Spirit into the wilderness and suffered temptation for 40 days. And then Ellen White speaks about letters that have been sent to her. Letters have been coming into me, affirming that Christ could not have had the same nature as man, for if he had, he would have fallen under similar temptations. If he did, now Ellen White explains, if he did not have man's nature, he could not be our example. If he was not a partaker of our nature, he could not have been tempted as man has been. If it were not possible for him to yield to temptation, he could not be our helper. It was a solemn reality that Christ came to fight the battles as man in man's behalf. His temptation and victory tell us that humanity must copy the pattern. Man must become a partaker of the divine nature. Let me just read the last one that I have here in my notes. 
What love. What amazing condescension. The king of glory proposed to humble himself to fallen humanity. He would place his feet in Adam's steps. He would take Adam's, he would take man's fallen nature and engage to cope with the strong foe who triumphed over Adam. He would overcome Satan, and in thus doing, he would open the way for, redemption, for the redemption from the disgrace of Adam's failure and fall of all those who would believe on him. Can we have the same overcoming power that Jesus had? Let me just read you a couple of statements. Sin could be resisted and overcome only through the mighty agency of the third person of the Godhead who would come with no modified energy but in the fullness of divine power. It is the Spirit that makes effectual what has been wrought out by the world's Redeemer. It is by the Spirit that the heart is made pure. Through the Spirit, the believer becomes a partaker of the divine nature. Christ has given His Spirit as a divine power to overcome all. All what? To overcome all hereditary and cultivated tendencies to evil. Wow! I'm going to skip the next one and I'm going to go to the one after that. The tempter's agency is not to be accounted an excuse for one wrong act. Satan is jubilant when he hears the professed followers of Christ making excuses for the deformity of character. It is these excuses that lead to sin. There is no excuse for sinning. A holy temper, a Christ-like life is access accessible to every repenting, believing child of God. Now I'm going to read a final statement from Ellen White. It has three parts, but it's the one single statement. Let's read the first part that has to do with us. This is uh, from the book, The Great Controversy, uh, page 623. First part deals with us. Now while our great high priest is making atonement for us, we should seek to become perfect in Christ. How perfect? Hmm. Not even by a thought could our Savior be brought to yield to the power of temptation. No, he had a sinful nature, but not even by a thought would Jesus yield to temptation. And then she explains about us. Satan finds in human hearts some point where he can gain a foothold. Some sinful desire is cherished. Ah, this is where the sinful tendency is what? It's strengthened because we yield to the tendency. So once again, Satan finds in human hearts some point where he can gain a foothold. Some sinful desire is cherished by means of which his temptations assert their power. In other words, sin is conceived, if you please. So that's us. Now, let's, no let's notice about Jesus. Second part of this single statement. But Christ declared of himself, the prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me. Satan could find nothing in the Son of God that will enable, would enable him to gain the victory. He had kept his father's commandments and there was no sin in him that Satan could use to his advantage. And so you say, well, one case is us and the other case is Jesus. <laughs> Let me read the last third part of this statement. Amazing. This is the condition what she just described about Jesus, not even by a sinful thought. This is the condition in which those must be found who shall stand in the time of trouble. The last generation will be a generation with sinful natures until this corruptible body is transformed at the coming of Jesus. They will have a sinful nature totally under the control of the Holy Spirit. Because during the time of trouble, there will not be a mediator or an intercessor for sin. May the Lord strengthen us. May we pray for the Spirit that He might give us victory over sin.